Today, January 29, 1977, marks the dawn of a new significant era in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. On the grounds of the President's House, Port of Spain, guests are gathered for the inauguration of our first elected president, Ellis Emmanuel Innocent Clark. Among them are the Prime Minister, Dr. Eric Williams, members of government, the judiciary, the diplomatic corps, and religious organizations. The Honorable Chief Justice Isaac Hayatali administers the oath of office. Your Excellency. As the duly elected president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, are you ready and willing to enter upon the duties of your office on this 29th day of January in the year of the Lord, 1977? And for that purpose, to take and subscribe the oath of office prescribed by the Constitution. I am. Will you then take the Bible in your right hand and say after me, I, Ellis Emmanuel Innocent Clark, I, Ellis Emmanuel Innocent Clark, do swear by Almighty God, do swear by Almighty God, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, and to the best of my ability, and to the best of my ability, preserve and defend the Constitution and the law, preserve and defend the Constitution and the law, that I will conscientiously and impartially, that I will conscientiously and impartially, discharge the functions of President, discharge the functions of President, and will devote myself to the service and well-being of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and devote myself to the service and well-being of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So help me God. Having taken the oath of office, President Ellis Clark addresses the nation. Almost exactly four years ago, on the 31st of January 1973, to be precise, I was sworn in as Governor General of Trinidad and Tobago. I took an oath that I would be faithful and true allegiance bear to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. That oath was prescribed by our 1962 independence constitution. In 1962, we had traveled the familiar road that leads from the dictatorship of Crown Colony government via internal self-government to the desirable goal of independence. Very shortly after independence, it was my privilege to help to secure for us our appropriate place amid the family of independent countries at the United Nations. Later, it was my good fortune to be called upon to steer us into several organizations and groupings, particularly the Organization of American States and the Inter-American Development Bank. Today, 
the will of the people freely expressed has resulted, albeit immediately, in my assuming office as the first elected president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. How vastly different is the oath that I have just taken from that earlier one four years ago. The earlier oath was simply an oath of allegiance to a sovereign. Our country found no mention in it. Today, it is to Trinidad and Tobago that I have pledged to be faithful and bear true allegiance. Today, it is to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, their service and their well-being, that I have sworn to devote myself. Section 37 of our Republican Constitution requires me to take this oath before entering upon the duties of my office. None of you, my fellow citizens, is required by the Constitution to participate with me in that oath. But I, I beg you to pledge yourselves here and now, silently, as I did vocally, to bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago. I entreat you to devote yourselves to the service and well-being of every one of our fellow citizens. I implore you to banish any sentiments, any attitudes, any preconceived notions, any, any concepts or ideas that might tend to divide or embitter us or alienate us one from another. I beseech you to look upon and regard every one of our fellow citizens without exception as a sister or a brother and to act accordingly. Then, and then only, will my oath be the leaven with which our entire society is leavened. Then, and then only will we justly reflect upon today as the dawn of a new significant era, as a proud milestone in our history, as a blessing for our people. I pray, Almighty God, and I ask you to join in my prayer, will permit that this should come to pass. Thank you. Traditional sound of parting, Olang Zine, played by the band of the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment under Lieutenant Wade, was a fitting prelude to the occasion 
marking the end of the monarchical system of government in Trinidad and Tobago and the establishment of a new republic. Trinidad and Tobago, an independent nation since 1962, assumed a new status in severing its ties with the British crown. Ties which began when the island of Trinidad became a British possession in 1797. Under the country's new constitution, the person holding the office of Governor General at the commencement of the constitution shall hold the office of President until a president is elected and assumes office. The first president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago is sworn in by the country's Chief Justice. I shall now swear in the president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. I, Ellis Emmanuel Innocent Clark, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago and to the best of my ability preserve and defend the Constitution and the law, that I will conscientiously and impartially discharge the functions of President and will devote myself to the service and well-being of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, so help me God. I should now like to read a message which I received a short while ago from Her Majesty the Queen until a few moments ago, the Queen of Trinidad and Tobago. On the inauguration of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and your assumption of office as President, I send you warm good wishes for the future and for the welfare and prosperity of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is a source of great satisfaction to me that your country remains within the Commonwealth. I am confident that the friendly ties between the people of Britain and Trinidad and Tobago will be maintained and strengthened in the coming years. Elizabeth Regina. Warm greeting from the Prime Minister who steered the country towards republicanism. The new president graciously received the congratulations of other government ministers and the delighted guests. The new republic was ushered in on August 1st, 1976, and the previous symbols representing our association with the British Crown must be removed, being replaced by the new symbols representing our new republican status. Similarly, a new presidential standard must replace the former governor general standard. The president's standard the country's coat of arms bordered by a laurel wreath of 11 petals on either side on a blue background is unique to that office. Unfurled on a vehicle or a building, it signifies the presence of His Excellency. Mr. President, thank you for granting the government film unit this short interview. And through this wonderful medium of film, you have the opportunity of speaking not only to our citizens resident here, but also to our nationals wherever they may reside in the world abroad. They would want to hear from you, I think, of the significant differences between your being president of this new republic and your previous position as governor general. Well, first of all, before I answer your question strictly, let me say that I am grateful for this opportunity of perhaps clarifying 
a situation that is not as simple as one might assume it to be, and I therefore welcome the chance to say that the major change is that the president of Trinidad and Tobago is the head of state of the country. The governor general was the representative of a foreign head of state. The Queen of England was Queen of Trinidad and Tobago and of course of several other countries. And the Governor General of Trinidad and Tobago, although often referred to as the head of state, was really the representative of Her Majesty. Now Trinidad and Tobago has its own head of state. And I think this is important, it's a matter of substance, it's also a matter that is symbolical of the, shall I call it, adulthood of the nation. We have grown up, we now have our own head of state. In addition, the president has certain powers and duties that the governor general did not have. While the president is not an executive president, he does have a number of duties particularly in the field of making appointments. And many of these are key appointments. So that there is some dilution of the power formerly possessed by the Prime Minister and the transfer of a certain portion of the Prime Minister's power to the President. For instance, the President formally made many appointments acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister. And therefore he was, so to speak, the Governor General was a rubber stamp for this the purpose. General, yes. The Governor General, I mean. But the President will be making these appointments uh, after the consultation with the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition or other persons, as the case may be. And he acts essentially in his own discretion. To that extent, therefore, there is a change of substance and one which I personally think is clearly for the benefit of the country as a whole. Thank you, sir. Am I right in saying, sir, that you have been associated with the constitutional development of this country and were largely responsible for our 1962 constitution by which we attained independence? How early did you foresee a republican form of government by this country? And would you say this change to a republican form of government is a natural progression of the constitutional changes over the last few years? Well, I really became associated with the constitutional process in the year 1956. I was then acting Attorney General and constitutional changes were taking place. And drafts of the changes were exchanged between the Colonial Office and the Attorney General's department and I was involved then. I have I was thereafter involved in all the constitutional changes that took place until 1962. And in fact, I did the first draft of the 1962 Independence Constitution. And I was in fact at Marlborough House for the Independence Conference. So I had quite a bit to do with that. Now, in doing the draft, the first draft of it, obviously, I chose the monarchical system and not the republican system. This is very simply explained. I don't think the time was right. I don't think the time was right. I have no doubt that many of our citizens, perhaps because of our proximity to Latin America, uh, thought of a republic in terms of chaos, in terms of a lack of law and order, in terms of a deprivation of human rights and many other matters. And therefore, I uh, thought at the time that while a republican form of government was the appropriate one for us and would be so eventually, uh, one had to move cautiously. It was better to take two bites at that particular cherry and to move on to independence first. I remember there were lots of fears even about that, lots of apprehensions, and then to change as we've now done. So this, in effect, answers your question, whether I think of it as a natural progression. I most certainly do. How do you, Mr. President, as a man, feel about your elevated position, the highest office in the Republic? What does the presidency mean to you? 
Well, the presidency means to me an opportunity to serve my people. I think that all of us have a duty to be good citizens. Obviously, we can't serve in the same ways. We all have different roles assigned to us. I think fate has happened to assign this particular role to me and therefore I must do the best I can. Uh, it would be disingenuous of me to say that I wasn't pleased to be the first president of the Republic. But on the other hand, I think it's just the fate that happened to select me and I simply have to do whatever I can, like everybody else, to do my best for my people. Mr. President, one final question. You have stated what the presidency means to you. I am sure our citizens would like to hear your views on what the new Republic of Trinidad and Tobago should mean to them. Well, I think the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago should mean to them a country which they love, a country which they are prepared to serve. I think that hitherto we have been lacking in a vital quality, and that is patriotism. I should hope that this change to a republic will enable us to think of ourselves as one people and to think of our country as a place to which we are absolutely devoted and dedicated. If our people can get this from being a republic, then I think the change is more than justified. Thank you very much, sir. Thank <laughs> you.